Chapter 8, Section 6. How did working people view the rise of capitalism? The best example of how hated capitalism was can be seen by the rise and spread of the socialist movement in all its many forms across the world. It's no coincidence that the development of capitalism saw the rise of socialist theories. However, in order to fully understand how different capitalism was from previous economic systems, let's consider early capitalism in the U.S., which for many libertarians is the example of capitalism equals freedom argument. Early America was pervaded by artisan production, individual ownership of the means of production. Unlike capitalism, this system is not marked by the separation of the worker from the means of life. Most people did not have to work for another, and so they did not. As Jeremy Brick, uh, Brecker notes, in 1831, the great majority of Americans were farmers working their own land, primarily for their own needs. Most of the rest were self-employed artisans, merchants, traders, and other professionals. Other classes, employees and industrialists in the north, slaves and planters in the south, were actually relatively small, all things considered. The great majority of Americans were independent and free from anybody's command. These conditions created the high cost of combined wage labor, which ensured the practice of slavery continued to exist. However, towards the middle of the 19th century, the economy began to change. Capitalism began to be imported into American society as infrastructure was improved, which allowed markets for manufactured goods to grow. Soon, due to state-supported capitalist competition, artisan production was replaced by wage labor. Thus evolved modern capitalism. Many workers understood, resented, and opposed their increasing subjugation to their employers, the masters, to use Adam Smith's own expression. You know, the father of capitalism. Which could not be reconciled with the principles of freedom and economic independence that had marked American life and sunk deeply into the mass consciousness during the days of early economy. In 1854, for example, a, a group of skilled piano makers wrote, The day is far distant when they, the wage earners, will so far forget what is due to manhood as to glory in a system forced upon them by their necessity and in opposition to their feelings of independence and self-respect. May the piano trade be spared as, as such exhibitions of the degrading power of the day wage system. You can find this quote in um, Common Sense for Hard Times, page 26. Clearly, the working class did not consider working for a daily wage, in contrast to working for themselves and selling their own product, to be a step forward for liberty or individual dignity. The difference between selling the product of one's labor and selling one's labor, i.e. oneself, was seen and condemned. When the producer sold his product, he retained himself, but when he came to sell his labor, he sold himself. The extension of wage labor to the skilled worker was regarded by him as a symbol of a deeper change. Norman Ware, The Industrial Worker, 1840-1860. Indeed, one group of workers argued that they were, quote, slaves in the strictest sense of the word, as they had to toil from the rising of the sun to the going down of the same for our masters, I masters, and for our daily bread. You can find the same citation, Industrial Worker, 1840-1860, on page 42. Another argued that the factory system contains itself the elements of slavery. We think no sound reasoning can deny, and every day continues to add power to its incorporate sovereignty, while the sovereignty of the working people decreases in the same degree. Almost as soon as there were wage workers, there were strikes, machine breaking, riots, unions, and many other forms of resistance. John Zerzan's argument that there was, quote, a relentless assault on the workers' historical rights to free time, self-education, craftsmanship, and play was at the heart of the rise of the factory system. It's extremely accurate. You see more on that in The Elements of Refusal, page 105. It was an assault that workers resisted with all their might. In response to being subjected to the law of value, workers rebelled and tried to organize themselves to fight the powers that be and to replace the system with a cooperative one. 
As the printer's union argued, we regard such an organization, a union, not only as an agent of immediate relief, but also as an essential to the ultimate destruction of those unnatural relations at present subsisting between the interests of the employee and the employed classes. When labor determines to sell itself no longer to speculators, but to become its own employer, to own and enjoy itself and the fruit thereof, the necessity for scales of prices will have passed away and labor, uh, and labor will be forever rescued from the control of the capitalist. Little wonder then why wage laborers considered capitalism as a form of slavery and why the term wage slavery became so popular in the anarchist movement. It was just reflecting the feelings of those who experienced the wage system firsthand and joined the socialist and anarchist movements. As labor historian Norman, Norman Ware notes, the term wage slave had a much better standing in the 40s of the 19th century than it has today. It was not regarded as an empty shibboleth of the soapbox orator. This would suggest that it has suffered only the normal degradation of language has become a cliche, not that it has a grossly misleading characterization. These responses of workers to the experience of wage labor is important to show that capitalism is by no means natural. The fact is that the first generation of workers tried to avoid wage labor. Is it at all possible as, as, as they hated the restrictions of freedom it imposed upon them? They were perfectly aware that wage labor was wage slavery that they were decidedly unfree during working hours and subjected to the will of another. While many working people now are accustomed to wage labor while also, also, uh, while also hating their job, the actual process of resistance to the development of capitalism indicates, well, it's inherently authoritarian nature. Only once other options were closed off and capitalists given an edge in the free market by state action did people accept and become accustomed to wage labor. Opposition to wage labor and factory fascism was, is widespread and seems to occur wherever it is encountered. Quote, research has shown, summarizing, uh, summarizes William Lazenek, that the freeborn Englishmen of the 18th century, even those who by force of uh, circumstance had to submit to agricultural wage labor, tenaci uh, tenaciously resisted entry into the capitalist workshop. Business organization in the myth of the market economy, page 37. British workers shared the dislike of wage labor of their American cousins. A member of the Builders Union in the 1830s argued that the trade unions, quote, will not only strike for less work and more wages, but will ultimately abolish wages, become their own masters, and work for each other. Labor and capital will no longer be separate, but will be indissolubly uh, joined together in the hands of workmen and workwomen. Quoted by jo uh, Joffrey Ostergaard, The Tradition of Workers' Control, page 133. This is un unsurprising, for as Ostergaard notes, the workers then, who had not been swallowed up whole by the Industrial Revolution, could not make critical comparisons between the factory system and what preceded it. While wage slavery may seem natural today, the first generation of wage laborers saw the transformation of social relationships they experienced in work from a situation in which they controlled their own work, and so themselves, to one in which others controlled them. And they did not like it. However, while many modern workers instinctively hate wage labor and having bosses, without the awareness of some other method of working, many put up with it as inevitable. The first generation of wage laborers had the awareness of something else, although, of course, a flawed something else, but something else nonetheless. And this gave them a deep insight into the nature of capitalism and produced a deeply radical response to it and its authoritarian structures. Far from being a natural development, then, capitalism was imposed on a society of free and independent people by state action. Those workers alive at the time viewed it as unnatural relations and organized to overcome it. These feelings and hopes still exist and will continue to exist until such a time as we organize and abolish the wage, uh, wage system. And, well, the state supports it. <laughs>